What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Scott Proctor, alongside my guy, Matt Morris, per usual. And we're back with another episode of Simple Question. But this time, we'll have more than one because we've got a special guest joining us today for the first time, NFL Draft Editor at CBS Sports, Kyle Stackpole. Kyle, how are we doing, my man? Thanks for joining us. Hey, how's it going, guys? Happy to be on. It was it was a great past three days after months and months of speculation and what we think is going to happen. It's just nice to know all where all 62 picks, who they are, where they're going, what the teams look like. And now we can move on to OTAs, mini camp and then training camp. And the season's going to be here before we know it. So looking forward to it. No doubt about it. It's an exciting time. Uh, no doubt about it. But let's, let's, dive right into things. let's dive right into things. I want to start um, on day one of the 2022 NFL draft. What was the biggest surprise to you on day one? Obviously, whether it be, you know, teams trading up, trading down, uh, somebody reaching or even, you know, somebody falling in that first round. What kind of took you by surprise, something you didn't necessarily see coming beforehand prior to the first round of Thursday's draft? Yeah, so I'll touch on this one quick just because I think it's so obvious and it's got to be Cole Strange going to the Patriots. And you just you're like, this guy was probably going to be available in the second round, potentially even early in the third round. And all of a sudden you see him pop up at 29. And I mean, it's the Patriots and it's Bill Belichick. So you proceed with caution when you're going to call yeah. any sort of their picks a, you know, a reach <laughs> or a surprise or anything like that because they just end up figuring it out. But that was a huge surprise to, I think, anyone who covered the draft closely going into it. Another one, another bonus I'll give is I think just Jermaine Johnson dropping. I think there were, he, he gained so much momentum from what he did at the Senior Bowl because before the Senior Bowl, he wasn't really seen at – he was more seen as a back half of the first round, early second round pick. But then from the Senior Bowl on, he just gained this crazy amount of momentum that as we led up to draft week, people even had him going to the Jets at number four overall. I mean, if not four, then, then in the top ten. So the fact that he fell all the way to 26 and the Jets were able to trade back into the first round and get him, I think was – Awesome for the Jets, but pretty surprising that he fell that far. Kyle, I want to dig in a little bit to, to the strange, the, the Cole Strange pick. Um, do you think that Belichick and kind of that front office deserves a little bit of benefit of doubt, even though, you know, Belichick is, is great, arguably the greatest coach ever. He hasn't necessarily drafted that well, but do you still he think deserves that benefit of the doubt? And what do you think the Patriots brass kind of saw in Strange that, you know, made them pull the trigger there in the first round? Yeah, um, I think I think he does uh, earn the benefit of the doubt. I mean, he has a couple picks in the past from smaller schools. Um, Kyle yeah. Kyle Duggar not too long ago um, ter- has turned out to be a pretty good pick. Um, I mean, I I know Belichick explained like why he picked he he, he said he, he claimed to explain why I picked him, but he really just said, oh, he was the best player on our board, and then he was available when we were picking. And even if we were picking at number twenty one, he probably would have been the pick. But I don't know. I just don't see any of Cole Strange's attributes being better than any one of the guys that would have been available when they picked. I think sure. you could pick any number of guys, look at a couple of different areas and say, you know what, this guy would have been better. And it's just, just going from that level of competition, you get that with all the small school guys, but someone in the first round going from Tennessee Chattanooga to the NFL level, it's just going to take time to, to acclimate. And with some other needs that the Patriots had, it, it definitely was surprising that, that, you know, they went with, with this pick at, at this position at 29 overall. Yeah, and actually, I want to stay in that division. Uh, Kyle, you mentioned it. Jermaine Johnson fell all the way to the Jets, and they were able to trade back in. Uh, but just looking at some of their picks between Sauce Gardner, uh, Wilson, you, you, uh, Jermaine Johnson, and then I also really like Brees Hall going there. How impressed were you with what the Jets were able to do? And, and is this an, also a situation where you have to take it with a grain of salt because it's the Jets, and, and even though these guys have all the potential in the world, uh, what do you think this draft class can do for the Jets? Yeah, no, I mean, obviously you're going to take any draft with a grain of salt, and, and yes, it's the Jets. But with, with two first-round picks, it really, it really seemed like a no-lose situation for them at 4-10 and 10 because of the positions that they need needed and – where the draft was top heavy, but even after seeing this class, I think they, they really exceeded the expectations with what they were able to get to get someone like sauce Gardner, number four, he's someone that is at a premium position and someone that the jets have really needed. They need, they just need a true number one guy at that spot 
who can really lock it down. So that was number one, getting him, and then getting Garrett Wilson, the you know, the seen as the number one receiver on a lot of people's boards, and getting him at number ten. And I know that was a popular pick for them to get for them mock, him mocked to them. And sometimes a popular pick it just doesn't turn out that way, and teams decide to you know go off the beaten path and select other guys. So the, to get those two guys first. And then to trade back and get Johnson was just the, the icing on the cake. And I agree with you. I like the Brees Hall pick as well. It, it, I didn't see it coming just because you know, Michael Carter did play well last year. But I think you have to credit Joe Douglas and the coaching staff for realizing this is a guy that we really like. And we think that we can uh, change our running back room, which is you know average, maybe a little above average if Michael Carter was, was good this year, and just make it into a strength with both of them on the field. Um, and both of them get and run. So I think what they – basically, if you just ended after those first four picks, you consider it a, a huge success for the Jets. And I think the, their fans deserve it after everything they've been through. It seems like they're putting all the pieces around Zach Wilson to be successful, and it's either he's going to sink or he's going to swim. If he swims, great. If he sinks, then there's a lot of quarterbacks next year who the Jets can go after. But I think they did everything they could in this draft to – set the team up for success in the future. Yeah, I think that was priority number one for the Jets, just insulating and building around Zach Wilson, giving him weapons and, you know, kind of just just protecting him and making sure he makes a leap in year two. And they did that. I don't think anybody was a bigger winner in this draft than the Jets uh, and the Ravens as well. I would throw in there as well, getting the best safety and Kyle Hamilton, the best center uh, and Linderbaum from Iowa. I think they did a hell of a job even getting uh, a job as well. But um, I want to talk a little bit about the quarterbacks um, in terms of which quarterback do you think kind of landed in the best spot I want to exclude Kenny Pickett from this discussion because I think that's the easy answer I think you know him being back in Pittsburgh being uh he's going to be coach he's going to be well coached team with obviously Mike Tomlin they're going to have a good defense they're going to have weapons for him to throw to and hand the ball off to but you know talking specifically about the third round quarterbacks um Desmond Ritter Matt Corral uh and Malik Willis as well which one of those three guys do you think is kind of set up the best uh, moving forward here at the quarterback position? Yeah, I would probably say Malik Willis. Um, I just think, and I think a reason that he dropped and, and, and some of these other quarterbacks dropped is when you draft a QB that high, if you draft a QB in the first round, it basically starts the clock of, okay, when is he going to play? Mm -hmm. And if, if your quarterback isn't performing at an awesome level, then there's going to be calls to get this rookie quarterback in there because you've drafted so high but I think as you go down the board and you get down to second round and you go down to a third round pick there isn't that same call from the fan bases to get this guy out there because oh he's a third round pick let's give him time to develop and the Titans know that he they can sit him basically as long as they want and let him come along at his own pace whereas if he went to the Falcons or if he went to the Panthers then they yeah. could have their their quarterback they had could have been performing poorly and all of a sudden he gets thrown in there and he's not ready and then that just completely screws up his development and he ends up, you know, not performing to his potential. So I would say definitely, um, definitely Malik. And then Ritter's an interesting spot as well. I think it was a good pick by the Falcons because you can have him go up against Marcus Mariota, who we haven't seen in a while. We don't really know what he's going to be able to bring to the table, even being in Arthur Smith's offense. But you have them compete. And if Ritter's starting then that means he beat out Mariota he's playing pretty well and you see what happens rookie year maybe you have something and if Mariota wins a job then he's probably playing decently and you can let Ritter learn behind him and, and not have to rush and then you go into 2023 with you know Drake London you, know, you hope Calvin Ridley comes back Kyle Pitts yeah and all of a sudden you're set up to have a, a really solid offense as long as one of those quarterbacks becomes the guy so I think those two guys it would be in my order it would be Malik Willis Ritter and then Matt Corral because I just think the Panthers just don't really know what they're doing at the quarterback position I could see them going with they'll, they'll probably go with Sam Darnold I mean Ben McAdoo basically slipped that Sam Darnold is going to be the starting QB right. um right. and then if, but then if he struggles I could see them throwing Corral in there before he's ready and then the Panthers are back in this position next year where they don't know what they're doing and they gave up a third round pick next year just to move up and get Corral. So I don't really get what they're, what they're doing. And I was hoping that Corral would end up in a better situation just because I think he has, has 
pretty solid potential, but yeah. it's, it's, it's a tough spot with an organization that is just at a crossroads and just doesn't really know how to handle finding that guy in the future. No doubt. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting. And uh, it was surprising that they fell where they did, but it does make sense when you say it that way, Kyle. And I, I, staying in this later round of the draft, I think three through five is always so interesting because that's where you find these guys that kind of save the draft for a lot of these teams and they, they end up being looked at as steals. Uh, one that comes to mind is to me is always Aaron Jones with the Packers. This year, what were some of those picks that happened three through five that you were like, this is going to work. This feels like it's going to really work out. And this team made a good call. Yeah, I think uh, one of the guys would be uh, Daniel. I was mispronouncing the name. Falele, I think it might, might be from Minnesota. The, uh, the massive, yeah. Op- yeah. massive yeah. offensive tackle. Yep. And I think Oops. the main reason he fell is because he is – so big and a lot of teams don't understand how to use linemen that are that large but the Ravens are one of the teams that know how to use them and because they they basically molded Orlando Brown into a, a pro bowl lineman and then you look what, what his career has become so I just think for, to get him that late the Ravens just do such a good job of they understand how to use these prospects that maybe some other teams don't and that's why they fall and that's why it always seems like when the Ravens are on the clock they're going to get a guy that probably should have been taken at least around earlier um so I would say he is definitely one and then this is this is round three so I'll say Nicobe Dean um going to the Eagles it's it's interesting because you see reports out there that um he you know, had the injury but then independent doctors cleared him and he said he's going to be ready to go for rookie mini camp but then again you have all these teams that passed on him not only in the first round not only in the second round but at the start of the third round as well so but just his just his talent and his leadership and he was the heart of that georgia defense and georgia's defense is interesting because there were so many it was historically great but there were so many players drafted and you have to think that at least a couple of those players are going to turn out to be the benefit of those, the guys around them. Yeah. Some guys are going to be, okay, they were the best players on this defense and it's going to show on the NFL. And the other people were going to be byproducts of, of their peers and they're not going to be as good. But I think the Kobe Dean has the intangibles, has the instincts. He might be undersized, but I just think, especially now too, he's going to have that chip on his shoulder of all these teams passing on him because of an injury history. I think it was his stature combined with it with the injury was something that teams just wanted to stay away from. But I don't know. I think he's going to be a, a really solid player in the middle of that defense and someone that uh, the, the Eagles really needed at the second level. Kyle, I know a lot of Packer fans are probably really hoping that they picked the uh, the guys that were the difference makers on that defense instead of the byproducts of it. Um, so, that, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see, like you said. I love both those answers, Kyle. I already mentioned earlier that I thought the Ravens did a hell of a job drafting. And I think, yeah, the Eagles getting Jordan Davis and the Kobe Dean, which I think were the two heartbeats of that Georgia defense, you know, both in Philly, I think is, is going to be a, a massive, a massive plus for their defense moving forward. Probably last question we got for you, Kyle, before we let you get up out of here. We know you and, and your guys at CBS Sports have already done the groundwork, the legwork on the 2023 NFL draft. So give us a little preview of that. Who do, you, who do you see going at the top number one of next year's draft? And what do you kind of see that the top couple prospects at top five kind of shaping out to look like? Yeah, when you talk about the, the quarterback position, it's just totally it's polar opposite. Because this year you saw what happened. It was a historic draft in terms of guys not being drafted high. And then you have going into next year, you already have three or four guys that are being looked at as top 15, top 10, like top 10 picks potentially number one overall when you talk about Ohio State's C.J. Stroud, Bryce Young, you have uh, Will Levis um, from you know Kentucky who transferred uh, to Pittsburgh. So just those three guys. And then even a guy from Boston College, I think is Bill Jerkovic. Um, so all the guys that stayed in school and, and the young guys that are coming up, it's, it's going to be really fun next year to see where, first of all, how they perform in the fall, because as we know with Sam Howell and yeah. uh, Spencer Rattler being the top two picks at this time last season. You know how that turns out. Yeah. But I think there's a couple of these guys that are just foolproof. I think Stroud is, is going to be a high pick. I think Bryce Young is going to be a high pick. I think Will Anderson 
could be, uh, I think he talent wise and he's the best out of all of them. And I think that if, if QB wasn't such a valued position, then you could pencil him as him in as a number one pick right now. And I think you could have penciled him in as a number one pick this past year. That's how good he was and how good he is. And he's just, he's going to be whoever can get him at number one next year or, you know, wh- whoever has a number one pick next year, if they don't need a quarterback, that's going to be a great spot to be in because you're going to be able to potentially trade back with guys who want to go after Stroud or Bryce Young or any of these other quarterbacks that make that leap. Um, whereas this past year, the Jaguars were open to trading the number one pick. No one was moving up. It wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. So I think it's, it's going to be really exciting and it's going to be, it's, it's going to be worth watching throughout the college season because there are so many and, we're, that, that's going to dominate headlines, whereas this year dominated headlines for the wrong reasons. This is yeah. going to be a spot where, and you and you saw these teams too. They they didn't want to risk a high pick this year on going for a quarterback because they knew that next year they could go after. It. And I'm not saying they didn't pick it because of that, but they mm-hmm. just realized that there were other players at other positions that they could really help them more. And then if you end up not doing well this year, then okay, it's a pretty great consolation prize to potentially get one of those quarterbacks next year. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think it's going to be fascinating to see how how this kind of works out, particularly in the fall. And this year was a perfect example. I think Sam Howell before before last fall would have been a, a surefire top 10-ish pick. And you mentioned Spencer Rattler was up there, and we, we know what, what, where Rattler's deal now is at this point. Um, but, yeah, I agree. I think Bryce Young is going to be a superstar at the next level. I can't wait to see how, how this fall unfolds and see where he lands a, a year from now. But but this has been awesome, Kyle. Um, insightful. Um, go follow Kyle's great work on CBS Sports. Go follow him on, on Twitter. Um, but for Scott Proctor, Matt Morris, our guy Kyle Stackpole, um, we'll catch you on the next episode of Simple Questions.